Welcome to the Startups Without Borders podcast. I'm Valentina Primo, and I'm the founder of this platform, this community, and this movement for entrepreneurs who are starting new ventures while starting new lives. Each week, we'll be sharing inspiring interviews with the most audacious startup founders while highlighting resources for anyone starting up. Gear up to get some real-life advice. You're listening to the Startups Without Borders podcast, episode 10. Today, we want to bring you another of the amazing panels that took place at the Startups Without Borders Summit. We decided to talk about an issue that seems obvious for many entrepreneurs who are familiar with the startup landscape, but poses a question for those who think of their companies as a lifelong endeavor. In this panel, we're going to talk about exits. And we've invited the founder of Harmonica, the Egyptian matchmaking app that was acquired by Match.com very recently, Sameh Saleh. Now, Sameh sits with Karim Khalifa, whose digital agency network Digital Republic was acquired in 2016, and took key figures in the Middle Eastern startup scene. Raja Tontawi, head of entrepreneurship at Egypt's Technology, Innovation and Entrepreneurship Center, and Mohamed Saleh, country manager of Startup Grind in Jordan. I'd like to introduce the uh, moderator of this panel. Uh, he's a good friend of mine, all the way from Jordan, Mohamed Salah. He is the um, country manager for Startup Grind, and he's been in this startup ecosystem for around eight years now. The guy knows almost everything about everything when it comes to entrepreneurship, startups, and what have you. Uh, and he's moderating the panel today. So ladies and gentlemen, Mohamed Salah. Thank you. It's good to be here. Uh, I just, by the way, you said all the way from... Cairo, uh, uh, Jordan. I actually just came from the same city where Mudathir Sheikha were been raised. So okay. it was. I had a very uh, lovely uh, moment on the band, uh, on the stage over there, mm -hmm. talking about how much Mudathir was successful in the region here. Oh. By the way, a month ago uh, or a couple of months ago, I was very, very unhappy that um, Uber acquired Karim, and I was like, Karim had a chance to go for listing or stuff. And when I saw the IBO of Uber, I was like, no, Karim have done the right thing. I was wrong. And uh, now it's time to invite two great exits and to the stage have been done in, in Egypt very recently. One of them is very recently. One, the other one was like three years ago. And also I'd like to invite Ms. Shara to stage two because we need uh, the third a third opinion, I would say, because everyone else is somehow a founder or, or something else, but it's always nice to have an ecosystem enabler on stage. So please welcome my three speakers to stage. So let's start with the introductions. So let's go from Samah. He's the superstar of the ecosystem these days. Everyone's talking about him. So let's, uh, let's start from Samah. Uh, thank you. Um, so I'm Samah Saleh, um, founder and CEO of Harmonica, um, so which recently got acquired by Match Group, so now we are a part of Match Group. A little bit about myself, so um, after high school I, I studied in, uh, in Asia, in Malaysia specifically, so I spent like um, almost 14 years living abroad, and then um, I found that actually um, Two, almost two startups before Harmonica, almost like a few months before Harmonica. And then that was the reason where I quit my job as an engineer, and then I came back to Cairo. So, go ahead, Rosha. Hi, <clears throat> I'm Rosh Tantawi. I am um, head of entrepreneurship at a center called Teak, uh, which um, I don't know if any of you is familiar with. It's uh, part of a bigger organization called Etida. And Teak is... Um, uh, plays the role of an en the enabler in the ecosystem. It's not really governmental. It's what we call quasi-governmental. So it's uh, a collaboration between the public and private sector. And our main focus or mandate is to enable innovation and grow the entrepreneurship ecosystem with a focus on tech startups. Um, so our moderator asked me to say something personal about myself. <laughs> 
And um, I'm just going to connect with the other panel because it was so interesting. Um, I'm, I'm actually an engineer, and um, I didn't grow up in, in, in Cairo or, or Alexandria, where I come from. I grew up in Kuwait. And uh, I was actually a civil engineer, and I got a master's in civil engineering, and I became the regional manager of this huge construction company. And then one day I woke up and decided I'm so in love with innovation I'm just going to, um, to, do, to, to do something about it. And I started studying innovation, and then I, I founded a, a packaging company with the, my husband to make these small gadgets that they put in containers. <laughs> and then I decided to help others. So it's, it's, very, it's very passionate to my heart to, to help other and others, and especially to help women who, who want to go through this journey. So that's a little personal. Okay, Karim, please tell me you are not an engineer, because otherwise I'd be running away from this panel now. Uh, I have to inform you that I am an engineer <laughs> as well. <laughs> but right now I feel like a rock star because I've always wanted to know how it feels it to have uh, all these bright lights. So this is how it feels. Okay, um, I'm Karim Khalifa. I'm the uh, founder and former CEO of Digital Republic, which is a digital advertising agency, one of the first in, in the region, which uh, uh, we exited to the Dentsu Aegis Network uh, in 2016. And I personally just uh, finished my time uh, with them uh, in uh, this last, just last summer. So um, hence the former, former CEO. Uh, on a personal note, since I left the business after the exit, I become a running coach. So I'm coaching running, which has got nothing to do with digital advertising. Um, so, but that's my, my latest passion, running and being part of the ecosystem in the startup world. I think running is something that are very needed today, taking yeah. into consideration what have digital channels have done to our lives. So I, I'm sure you feel you're doing an amazing job. Thank you. And I think, you, I think, the, I think the same, by the way. So Samah, let's get into exits. Uh, do you think getting your startup acquired should be the main goal from day one? So, actually, I think that um, exits is not the end goal. The end goal is like to achieve the vision that why you started your startup from the first place. And I actually not just saying that like it's uh, it's it's the north like they say the north star that that guides you in every decision in your uh, entrepreneurship life or in the, your startup life is like was that gets me closer to achieving my vision and what's the vision is definitely not an exit. The vision is basically solving the problem of why you started your startup. So, um, like for example, in our case, uh, the exit was a very, um, uh, I believe is a very good step in achieving our, our vision of solving the problem. Um, but having that said, if you actually want to do a VC backed startup, and you don't plan your exit from your first day, you will not raise money to achieve your vision and so on and so forth. So having the exit in, in mind is crucial, but it should not be your end goal. So exit is, a, is a, like we say, a vehicle or something that would convince actually investors and, and VCs to give you money so you can grow your startup and achieve your main vision, which is solving the problem. Do you think we should look at exiting your company as some form of funding your company in a way or other? Like taking into consideration, there's most of the cases, the founder will still keep uh, some shares, still working for their companies even after the acquisition? Yeah, I mean, like, uh, without, no, I'm talking about it as a concept. Without having the exit in mind from day one, investors would feel a little bit, um, not much. So yeah. it's like a carrot for the investors, yes. right? Yes, and a very, very legitimate carrot. Because, like, if, if I'm an investor and I'm giving you uh, investment, I expect returns. And uh, it's a very, um, uh, uh, the way they calculate the returns is very, uh, is very clear, it's very obvious, it's very fair. So if you don't really plan your exit from day one, then you can't call yourself like a really VC-backed uh, startup because startups that go for IPOs are very rare, and, and especially in this region. I think if you're not going for an IBO or, or you're not going to be acquired, this is some sort of a lifestyle business. It cannot be, you cannot call it a startup because, as you know, if it's not, I would say, tech-based, VC-backed, uh, super scalable, that will not be called a startup, at least from the VC point of view. Exactly. Russia, what do you think? I would have to agree with Sema. 
uh, honestly. I think it's very important to uh, have it there as a, as a, as a, as a, as a goal, as an, as an end thing that you, uh, you want to reach. I think also it's very important to uh, have it uh, very clear so that you can put it on the table when you are um, you know going for invest raising funds and going for investors but i wouldn't I, I wouldn't say that this is what you should be focusing on on your journey and you're, there's so many other things that you need to focus on like like you said like your vision the, what you're trying to solve um, and I would say also growing the brand creating the brand this this is very important so I, I would agree with Sema 100%. Karim, uh, what do you think? Uh, taking into consideration, your business is quite different than Sameh's business. He's a tiki, um, sounds very, I would, say, I would say, more attractive than your business model as a service company. So tell, tell, tell me the first, your opinion, what do you think of exiting? And after that, we can go through the journey you guys had for almost nine years. I think uh, that to answer just the question of this panel, which is, is the most important thing or main thing for a startup is to exit, I would say my answer, and we talked about it earlier, my answer is yes, but. And there's a big lot of things around the but, or the yes, and. Um, and for example, in our case, uh, we, um, it was not, never something in mind. So you have to always ask yourself, what is uh, the purpose of you wanting to exit? You know, okay, there's the money, which is, you know, maybe a significant part of it. But there are so many other things that you have to consider. Is this something you're going to stay with after you've been acquired? In other words, are you bringing partners or are you bringing somebody who's just going to acquire you and you're going to leave? And if it is a, a, a partner that you're bringing on board, then you have to look at so many aspects like cultural fit. Um, is the new management that's going to come on board going to be people that you like to work with? Uh, how are your existing employees going to take it? Are they going to stay? Are they going to go? So there's so many things involved with the acquisition part other than the money that make it uh, uh, a very important. So you ask yourself, what is the objective I'm trying to achieve by exiting or by, by being sold? Other than the money, are you trying to grow the business? So is this partner that you're bringing on board, are they going to help you expand regionally, globally, give you new capabilities, give you multinational uh, uh, expansion opportunities? Um, are they going to uh, 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 enable you to launch new revenue streams? You know, are you part of the story uh, go of growth going forward or, or not? I mean, for my case, it was, and I think they talked about it in one of the panels, I think the Omar, the, the, the two Omars panel, which is uh, there was a fear of what would happen if I ever wanted to leave this business. So, uh, so there's a fear of, of failure in a way of if, 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 if I don't sell this, if I don't get it on a nice big ship moving forward, the day that I want to leave, I have to close up shop and say, everybody, sorry, you're out of a job. It's time to go home. That was one big fear for me, uh, which drove me to, to really push for, for it. So everyone has a different objective, a different reason. But you have to look at more than just the money. Are, are the acquirers or partners, are they going to come in and help you, like Samir was saying, drive your vision to, to make this a bigger play uh, uh, or not? So it's, it's a yes, but consider there's a lot of implications around it, and the journey, the journey is long and, and, and not straightforward. It's very easy to, um, to talk about things when it's already done, or it's not really happened. So what I have to do as a founder today, to all the founders in the room, uh, to make my company ready to be acquired or appealing in the first place to, to be acquired? Well, I'm an advertising guy. I'm a PR guy. I'm a, I'm a marketing guy. So I believe strongly in um, half of your success is what you do, really. And the other half is how well you're shouting about what you do. So uh, that's, that's a, a really, uh, and I think that guided my uh, direction on, on this. So, you know, especially when it's a tough market and there's a lot of competitors and you're in a, you're in a crowded area potentially. I mean, we were lucky we had some time first to market where we enjoyed not much competition. But after a while, it does happen to be a lot of competition. So how do you stand out? 
And I think um, in addition to, so first of all, shout about what you do. Do a lot of PR, um, go out there, go on stages, write thought leadership pieces, write publications, prove to the world that what you're doing is making a difference. So shout about what you do. Internally, you need to get yourself in shape because if anybody does come to talk to you, they're going to look at your numbers, they're going to look how you're managing your financials, they're going to look at your HR, uh, all of these things, legal compliance, IT, you know, try to as much as possible do those things that will put you into a good enough structure so that when somebody comes in to look at you, and they might be looking at other people, they will say, ah, these guys are in good shape, you know. Um, so those are some of the things you you know you would work towards before uh, before getting there. Samah, do you want to add more uh, points? Yeah, I agree, hundred um, percent. I think also you have to make sure of your business model. Uh, it makes a lot of a difference uh, when you're starting your business and you understand you did your research, you understand what are the other companies that is doing that, and if in the likelihood of there's an exit and acquisition. Who would be the acquirers and what are they looking for? And why would that acquirer not uh, do the same solution in your markets? And why it's going to be more expensive for him to fight you in the market but to buy your business? And would he be able to do it or not? How can you build barriers uh, of entry in the market so you make an exit story more likable? I think this is all the questions that you have to know from the first day, actually, before starting anything about your business model, about your market. <clears throat> can, I, can I ask them a question? Um, I just want to say one comment. Yeah, for sure you can ask them. You said a very, very important point about being out there telling your story. A lot of startups today, I hear, um, I hear from a lot of startups, like, I don't want to say my idea because people will steal it. I don't want to do too much marketing. I just want to close my door and work on my tech solution. They don't talk to anyone. We, we're going to get back to that. But you had a question, so go ahead. You make me forget the question. <laughs> So that was yeah, that's, that, that can be a very good solution. Okay. Um, I think it's a certain, you have to reach a certain stage before you can start shouting and talking. And you have to have some kind of credibility before you can start really talking and having thought leadership. So there is a certain stage that you pass. But more importantly, I, I always have the philosophy of, you know, if you're good and confident and what you're doing uh, is you're executing it right and, and you're doing it well, don't worry about somebody else uh, doing this. Uh, execution is, is, is very hard. Everybody's got great ideas. And if you're succeeding in execution, it's not that easy for somebody else to just come up and pick up and execute it. So uh, be less afraid of that. Um, but time your uh, exposure to the world at a point where you have got the strong execution behind you to back up your talking, you know? That, yeah, so that's, that's what I would say uh, in that area. I'll, I'll ask you later about execution because I think it's one of the main reasons why Match.com or Match Group looked at Harmonica. Parasha, what do you think the role for the government to play in, in the ecosystem, not only when it's come to exits, but in general? Like, what the government have to do to be, I would say, accelerating more the ecosystem and uh, creating some sort of, a, I would say, an ecosystem that's ready for more exits? Well, I think they should be enablers. I don't think they should be playing any other role. And um, what, what, they, what they should do to enable is always through the private sector or with the startups, with the ecosystem stakeholders. So. Um, what do they need? Do they? Is it policies? Is it regulations? Uh, putting the right environment. This is uh, this is number one. Um, but also, sometimes the, uh, they need certain a certain push. So, for example, our we work very closely with the ecosystem and drives up to come up with what's the main challenges and how can what can we do from our side uh, regarding these challenges and we just we just we worked with them within the manifesto and we came up with three important challenges and one of them was access to finance access to markets and access to mentors and we told them okay so 
Of course, we have limited funds. Which one do you want us to work on first? And we honestly thought we wanted to work on access to finance, and then these, and they all voted no, work on access to markets. And we worked together on what do you want? So do you want more uh, trade fairs? You want to, they want, you, they want to, how do you want to access these markets? And, and we went through all of that, and we came up with uh, sort of like more of like an internationalization package where um, um, we, we, you know, they wanted to say to, the, to go to the Levant, so we're, we're going to JITEC, they chose JITEC, and uh, we prepared a whole delegation to go to JITEC. Not fully funded, because we still believe that um, you sh- they should learn to pay for something. It's, it's you know, it's, it shouldn't be over 100%. So it's like 80% funded. Um, this year we're taking them to Slush, to CES in, um, in Las Vegas, uh, Viva Tech in, uh, in France, Spain, France. Web Summit, and um, what else? And Mobile World Congress. So, so all of this plan was, was put. Uh, we're also... Um, working and connecting with other governments so we can do some sort of a soft landing program because most of the startups that we talk to, uh, they start in this big market and then they're looking into the next biggest market, which is Saudi Arabia. Saudi. So, yes, Saudi. So they want to open up in uh, Saudi Arabia. And, uh, we thought, and we thought, you know, we'd start a soft landing program where they can, you know, soft land and we can help them with that to, to open up in this market. So these are some of the initiatives that we're taking. Um, on another point, we're trying to grow other smaller innovation ecosystems uh, you know, because Egypt is a very big country and it's very geographically spread, and it's not fair that everything should be happening only in Cairo. So we're we're creating these um, innovation hubs in eight second tier and third tier cities. We're building them as we speak. We're actually not building all of them. We're going to be building some, and the others we're going to be looking for old buildings like this one uh, to renovate. And there will be two messages. One is keeping our heritage, and out of this heritage, heritage comes innovation. And we'll be running, um, we'll not be running it, actually. We will be giving it to the private sector to run with certain, you know, uh, development goals in, in mind. So um, these are some of the things, yeah. You mentioned so many times the private sector. So yes. what do you think the, the role of the private sector here? Um, okay, there, there are many roles. The private sector is not just the startups, but also the corporates. No, no, so. I, but but I, what I mean by private sector is actually the corporates. Yeah, okay. So, well, um, you're talking about the corporates. Okay. And I, I think the corporates can offer mentors. It's, they, they, they can offer solutions. Uh, some of the technological solutions or platforms are not accessible to the startups, so they can make this... Uh, the data, too. The data, yes, but I think this is also with the government. So <laughs> there's more data with the government, trust me. I'm not aware of the, the <laughs> landscape the data, in Egypt. The data should be accessible uh, uh, in corporates, through the corporates, and through the government. And I, 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 I agree. <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm not really aware of the landscape in Egypt, but I'm not sure. Uh, so I'm not sure if the corporates in, in Egypt can actually share data with startups without governmental approval or not. So um, I'm sure, yeah. So I'm, I'm, so I'm just I'm just commenting on my question just to make sure that I'm not really aware of the situation. So um, going to Samah, there's a lot of hype now uh, today in the ecosystem. It's super hyped. Uh, there is amazing people like you have exited their companies, but there is only 20 exited, uh, 20 startups who have got acquired this year in the MENA region, according to to, to Magnet. Um, this is 20 out of thousands, if not tens of thousands of startups. And w- as we all know, that the margin for success in this ecosystem is literally 1% to 2%. Do you think uh, our youth today need to be starting their companies while they're in university, or they have to work and get experience, since you have worked yeah. in, in, in the corporate world, startups, and then you jumped into Harmonica. What do you think? Because a lot of statistics now, or I would say studies, are saying that the perfect age is 35, 40, 45. So what do you think of this? Well, it's a tricky question, I think. It's um, definitely like having an entrepreneurship spirit when you're young and like trial and error and failing in few startups, it helps. But I guess that working in corporates as well for a few years, it helps a lot. Like uh, within my story, like I, I worked seven years, six years into 
uh, a big corporate. Um, um, and then when I started, and that's actually think, something that people don't really uh, see or say a lot. Like you, you find everyone is being uh, inspirational and saying, oh, like I left my corporate life and I jumped into, take, took a huge risk and I jumped into startups. But I, di I didn't do that. I, um, I, st I founded my startups while I was working. And I would do my job like in the morning and then I would go back at night, work all night on the startups for almost two years, uh, balancing between the two until I really make, made sure that I have enough finance to cover me for a year or two. And then I quit my, uh, my corporate job. So it's all about like um, your appetite for risk taking and that the risk that you take should be calculated. Like you don't just uh, dump like a, a career for like, uh, you know, for like, you can do both, you can juggle between both. Also from a skills point of view, do you think today um, a yeah. graduate from, uh, or someone who's still at the university should be starting their businesses? Because honestly, I, I can't remember any, uh, anyone other than Mark Zuckerberg yeah. and Steve Jobs have succeeded <laughs> in that because almost everyone else had some sort of uh, Bill Gates too. So I can't remember anyone else, honestly, and this is uh, just three cases in the whole history. And I'm not sure if we can replicate these three yeah. stories very easy. From a skills point of view, do you think we need certain skills before we jump into doing our own business? Definitely, definitely. And that's something I've been like talking to like people when they ask me about this. I tell them like learn somewhere, like go learn somewhere. You learn much, much faster if you're working in a corporate or even better if you're actually joining a scale up, like a scale ups like maybe Swivel or like, uh, or like WhatsApp or all these like scale ups. Like look at people who exited Kareem and the amazing startups they are currently doing. They worked for three years, and they've seen what it takes to grow a startup. Some of them work as market launchers and stuff. And then your chances of growing your startup become significantly higher. So I'm totally on you with this point. I think they the really need to get experience and skills from a corporate or a scale-up. I think the only two exits I have my, in my mind right now from the Middle East um, happened this year is Karim and Mina Bait. And both of them, the founders, have been in the corporate world before starting their own businesses. Mudathar have been for so many uh, years uh, at McKinsey. So, Rasha, what do you think from uh, a private sector entity that works cl very closely with the government, so that means you guys also, in a way or other, contribute to, uh, I would say, students and universities and what the, the, the next skills coming, uh, coming up into the market. Do you think today, uh, Egypt need more founders or more developers or more. Um, how do you see the how do you see the the, the whole founding uh, landscape for, for 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 university students at least? Um, I, I think we should stop. It's not fair for us to market the Mark Zuckerberg and Steve Jobs. It's just it's so it's misleading. Definitely not, not, it's yeah. definitely not fair. Yeah, it's not fair, and you don't do an, a mobile application, and the next day you have uh, uh, you know a million downloads, and you become a millionaire, and you exit, and you sell it to. It's it's just a, too much of a Hollywood story. It took Mark Zuckerberg seven years. So yeah. And, and what really happens is this, is somebody working in the morning in their job, whether it's corporate or otherwise, and uh, they're making ends meet and they're bootstrapping and they're working nights and sometimes around, around the clock. That's the real story. And that's the story I think that, that, that needs to, you know, we put more light on it so that they understand, no, they, it, it doesn't happen. It's not that easy. And also, um, I, I'm pro that that you know you grow you grow the entrepreneurial skills or the entrepreneurial culture let's see because i am not i'm not somebody that believes that you can like, entrepreneurs are not made they're they're born somebody's entrepreneurial by nature that's my belief but it's important to have the culture so that the students when while you're a student you know that it's an option and you know that you have a government that supports you you have an environment that supports you that the ecosystem exists and when, once you take that leap you know one, two, three, four, where to do and what, where to go. But they should go into you know, the corporate world because there are so many skills that you can only acquire by working, whether in corporates or in scale-ups or even in startups. So I'm pro going into getting a job, working, and then doing whatever. And the solutions or the, that come out of those who worked in corporate. So I have so many startups coming out of those who worked in Vodafone, for example, because they have seen the problem and they know the solution and they have acquired enough skills to develop the solution. 
Thank you, Russia. Um, I just been informed that we have more five minutes. So one last question before going to the audience. What are your advices for Samah, who just now starting his, I would say, integration with Match.com or Match Group, since you almost have done with the journey uh, with Digital Republic? Um, you have to ask yourself first, is this something that you're in for the long haul or not? Um, and you have to be you know, clear to yourself whether this is something that you're in for the long haul or just for the time that they've kept you in for. So know, know, know your long-term objective. But um, one of the things that I found the most challenging was during the integration is that when you're changing, your startup is becoming a corporate. So you're integrating, having processes. You start to have HR and IT global and HR global and finance planning, and you start to lose uh, authority, and you can't just hire somebody. If you decide to hire somebody, you have to go through processes and so on. So I resisted a lot of that for quite a while to try to keep uh, the culture and the balance. Um, and I think that's fine, but to a certain degree, my advice would be to, you made a decision, you're in the system, now try to leverage this new possibility rather than sticking with the past, in a way. Um, and that's hard. Maybe you can do it for yourself, but the challenge will be to get all your employees to change that mentality. Uh, because they may have started in the beginning with you, they're, it's their baby, it's their family, and now suddenly they're a muazzafin, zayak, went asbahat muazzaf as well. Uh, you become an employee. So bring them on the journey with you. That will help you get buy-in from them. Um, so don't deal with the group lwahdak and leave them as just input. So bring them along with from the beginning. The other thing would be is to constantly promote to them the opportunities of being in this new environment, the global capabilities that they can uh, tap into, the peers uh, and, the, and the mentors globally they can learn from, the transfers to different parts of the world they can go to, uh, training, uh, all sorts of things like that. So you have to really do a lot of internal PR, actually to get the buy-in for this. Don't resist too much. Enjoy it. Uh, enjoy the benefits of being in, in, in a big company. You know, you, you don't have to worry so much about next month, can I pay the salary? You do have to a little bit, but just like they are killing you for budgets and plans, and the, the, the flip side of that is if you do badly one month, you've got match group to cover you. So, so look at it this way and, 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 and go with the flow. Um, but know in, inside you, is this something you want to go on to do forever or, or, or not? So um, I think we have time for one or two questions. So uh, anyone who has a question, just please, your hand, please. Can we have a microphone over there? Did all three of you actually have a bit of a, an exit plan in mind when you first started? And what time frame you gave yourself and on what basis you built that? Um, when I answer so, that? Yes. Yes. Go ahead. Um, yes, and and that was very important because um, you could see like the full plan, and then you could actually plan ahead. But let's be clear. Also, like exit is one option. Uh, it's the most like uh, option that people talk about. But there are definitely other options. Uh, but yes, like we've thought about it from uh, from first day, and we while even we're raising rounds and like you go through your seed round and like a series A, you actually talk about this plan to your investors to give them, um, to, to help them see where they can get their returns. Um, so definitely yes. Yeah. One more question. No one? Go ahead. Okay, actually we have another one. Hello everyone. Uh, I'm really glad to be uh, given this chance to talk to you. Uh, my question here is uh, for Karim, because Sam has already known the process, but uh, for Karim, uh, can you please answer this question? My question is, uh, how can small businesses grow in a bigger market? My point is here, 
actually how to aware the people about the certain services that you provide. This is my question. Sorry, can you repeat the question again? What's the... How can you aware the audience or the people about the product or the service that you provide? Okay, so you're talking about the like any headed the PR and the marketing of your of your product and service. Um, I think, like I said earlier, you have to first of all you have to have a solid execution. You have to have a good proof of concept. You have to have something that's working so that when you start making people aware, you're not um, you're talking about something solid. So that's the first thing. Then when you actually come to talk about this, um, I, I strongly recommend uh, being very much involved in the ecosystem of summits, conferences. The, the government is supporting people going to conferences everywhere, talking, panels. Get yourself on the map in these places as a thought leader. You have to be somebody who is an authority in the area that you're working in so that you can make yourself aware to the world in an effective way. So maybe writing publications, articles in relevant magazines or, or uh, uh, online publications. So being a thought leader, writing articles, and being out there speaking, presenting, networking, this is the way to do it, I think, uh, uh, on, a, on a PR level. If you're talking about for acquisition or for exit, I'm assuming that's what you're talking, not for growing your own customers. That's different. So we have the last question yeah. here. Um, hi, thank you um, for the great panel. And the, uh, I just wanted to ask um, uh, you guys about the uh, having the goal, uh, having the planning your exit from day one. So if uh, and uh, I think you, Samah, said that if you don't plan your exit from uh, oh no, it was sorry, this is Muhammad Salah. You said that if uh, you're not going to uh, plan your exit. And then there is no real goal. It's just uh, you, uh, someone said it's a lifestyle choice. Yeah, I said I said if if there is no plan to go for to go public or exactly. to be acquired, uh, there is no way for your investors to be getting a return on their investment. Exactly. Maybe your angel investors can be can be liquidate their 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 shares in one of the the upcoming rounds. But if there is no exit or there is no IBO. Um, I'm not sure if there is a way for uh, for the investors, especially the ones who who, who who came on a later stage, to get any return on their investment. Yes, and and then Samah, you said that uh, because uh, IPO is very rare, so it makes sense to plan for the exit. So my question is here: Why is IPO very rare, and is this something specific to Egypt? And if so, then um, like from yeah, whether your experience in the private sector or uh, Russia's experience in the public sector. Why is it a rare thing specific to this region? Thank you. I think it's it's a matter of maturity of the. Um, I'm sure we'll have maybe different opinions, but I think can I just say uh, one thing about IBO? To go on I, yes. to, to do an IBO mostly in the outside the United States, you have to be a profitable. And for tech startups to be profitable, this is such a dream. It's, it doesn't really happen. So go ahead, Sam. Yes. Um, so it's it's a matter of maturity of the ecosystem. So we started a little bit later than the U.S. and other markets. So I think actually the Middle East and, and this part, MENA is one of the, and Africa is one of the uh, least uh, companies that became unicorn and like who had like funding. The funding just started to come uh, only in the last few years. So we, we've been lucky, like uh, my generation of startups have been a little bit more lucky than the previous ones. So it's, it's just a matter of time. It's uh, maturity. So I, th I guess it will take us a few years until we hear like uh, much more IPOs and much more exits. But by nature, exit is much simpler. Like Mohammed Salah said, like exits is much more easier than IPOs. Um, IPOs usually require you to have like a certain profitable uh, uh, margins, and uh, you need to everything goes public, so you see like all the financials, and you, you have, have to disclose literally everything. Disclose and everything. The, the process itself it's super super costly. It costs millions of dollars. Yes. And if you if you want to IPO in the US, you mostly will have to hire to hire a bank like JP Morgan to do that. Yeah. And just hiring them will cost. I think in most of the cases, more than the total funding that most of the startups have it's raised in the MENA region. There is a listing for, um, for SMEs in Egypt. It's called Nilex. But for the, the reasons they, they just said, and for tech startups, it becomes even double more difficult. So there are very few, if, if any. 
We had our first IBO this year, yeah. Fauri, and um, yeah. hopefully we we're going to see more and more and more. I think there's another one coming up. Hopefully. Can, can we disclose I think, that? I, I can't, but I, I heard there's one coming up. You like what you hear? Then leave us a review on Apple Podcast. You can also get exclusive access to all the updates, the upcoming events, and the most inspiring stories by subscribing on startupswb.com forward slash subscribe. I'll repeat it, startupswb.com forward slash subscribe. I'd like to thank our amazing podcast partners in Egypt, our cast, for producing this entire season. 